This is an Ant Podcast Management production. Have you ever wondered what your dream lifestyle would look like? In a post-pandemic world, we're questioning our work-life balance more than ever. Why should we spend time and money commuting to an office when we can do our work from home? If you can do your work from home, then does that mean you need to live in the same town as your job? How about the same region? How about the same country? What if you could be location independent and break away from the restrictions of conventional life? This sounds like a dream, but what are we sacrificing to achieve it? Could this dream turn into a nightmare? Travel and adventure are great for the soul, but can you have too much of a good thing? Over the last couple of years, we have found out the answer to that question. Hello and welcome to What The Foe Travel Podcast. I'm Amy. And I'm Nick. On this podcast, we don't subject you to a boring slideshow of what we did on our holiday. Or a painful lecture on what visa or COVID documents you need. Through friends and experts, we learn, challenge and explore our way around the world. And we take you along for the ride. What are we talking about today then, Nick? Today, we're talking about digital nomads. Hello and welcome to What the Foe Travel Podcast with Nick and Amy. Thanks everyone for joining us for another episode. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the digital nomad lifestyle. In part one of two, we'll be telling you about our experiences as digital nomads, what worked for us, what didn't. We'll be honest and share some very personal details about why we stopped the digital nomad life and why we came home early. Plus, you'll be hearing from other digital nomads who can give you advice on how to achieve that lifestyle. Oh, for God's sake! What the hell's going on? What's happened? It's this hotel. It's taken me ages just to book one bloody hotel. It sounds to me like you need Rate Punk, which is today's episode sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Rate Punk. Stick around for this ad because we found a sponsor that will help you with your travels. Oh, this is so exciting, man. (laughs) One of the biggest problems in the travel industry is that people keep searching for hotel deals themselves, meaning they do it manually, which takes a lot of time and effort. Another big thing is that people can never be sure they're getting the best possible deal without searching through multiple providers to see their pricing options. The solution? Rate Punk! Rate Punk is a browser extension that scans all main booking sites and runs a live price comparison for the same hotel. Rate Punk's browser extension is free of charge. So there's no prepayments of any kind for you to use this as much as you'd like. So why wouldn't you use it? If you don't download it after this episode, then you must have more money than cents. Check out the link in the show notes or visit ratepunk.com forward slash what the foe to get started. Do you want to say rate punk one more time? Rate punk. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, what the hell is a digital nomad? So if you've been living under a rock or I'll I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, maybe it's your second language. (laughs) A digital nomad is someone who lives location independently. So they live and work while traveling around the world. So obviously a lifestyle like that, Nick and I both thought, wow, this sounds like the perfect lifestyle for us. We love traveling. We have our own business. All we need is an internet connection. You know, once COVID is fully done with, we are going to live that absolute dream lifestyle. We really thought we'd cracked it. And not only that, we thought we can travel, earn money. We can also save money because obviously if you're living in a country like Thailand, for example, that's considerably cheaper than somewhere like our home country, England, we can not only afford our lives out there earning pounds and dollars because we have some US clients, then we can save money. We'll come home billionaires, buy a bunch of property, life sorted. Sound great, Nick? Yeah, because I remember all like the traveling we've done when we've been budget backpackers. I remember thinking, this is so much fun. But imagine 
doing it with an income as well. Oh. Turns out traveling with money, not so fun. No, we like a challenge, don't we? Like how many times have we been traveling going, oh God, if we had money, we'd go eat in that restaurant or we'd blow a bunch of money over there. But yeah, it's not as fun when there's, there's not much of a challenge to it. So yeah, so we're going to get into it. We want to be completely honest. I mean, some of you may have seen online a bunch of people with their laptops on a beach thinking that they're living the lifestyle, but actually they're not telling you the truth. And that's what we're all about here on What The Foe. We like to tell you the truth. So it might be the lifestyle for you, but we're just giving you a word of warning in this, telling you things that maybe are a bit too difficult. Um, So hopefully by the end of it, you can make a choice whether you want this lifestyle or not. So let's go first into the positives, Nick. What were some of the highlights of our digital nomad life for you? Well, of course, being able to see new places, being able to get to know places much better, you know, living there as a local. We chose to go to Lisbon for our first location because we've been there before, like for a week, and we loved it. And we thought we want to get to know the place better. So, you know, when the weather's nice, you could take the occasional day off and go to the beach. We had a long weekend in the Algarve, south of Portugal, which, which was just so good. We, we were there with some friends as well. We had such a, a brilliant, brilliant time. And as, particularly that time we had in Lisbon, I look back very fondly, although, yeah, we, we'll get into kind of negatives of digital nomad life soon. Looking at the whole trip as a whole. So um, in our digital nomad life, we started in Lisbon. We then lived in Barcelona for a bit and then went to Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil after that. When we were in Barcelona, we lived right by the Sagrada Familia, which was quite cool. You went to some football games. I did not join you for those. Yeah, that was really good fun being able to watch FC Barcelona. And I went to another game, Espanol. That was great. You know, I, I'm living near these football teams, something I, I will probably never do again. So I took full advantage of that. Just getting to know Barcelona more. It's a city that actually a lot of people say they love. And Amy, when someone tells you they love a place, what does that do for you? I do not like it. <laughs> I, I would be the worst listener to what the foe because I don't like it when people go, oh my God, you'd love it there. And I think, really? don't tell me what I'd like. <laughs> yeah. So like if someone tells me how great a place is, I tend to go there like, I, I really want to change this part of my personality, but I, I just see a bunch of bad stuff and I'm like, why does everybody like it here? Um, but yeah, everybody says, oh, Barcelona is my favourite city and I, I just don't get it. No, I, I don't either. It's, it's quite a dirty city. In in parts, it is beautiful, um, but it, we don't really get it. We much prefer Lisbon. Something which was amazing that we did, we got out of the city. <laughs> we left Barcelona. That was amazing. <laughs> we left the city and went to the countryside and we got to watch <laughs> this uh Catalunian, I struggle with that word, Cat- Catalunya. We, we watched a Catalunian tradition of the, the... Catalunian. Catalunian tradition of the people who like stand on top of each other and make these human castles. Like the, uh, they take it really seriously and they compete in competitions. And if anyone's seen like images, uh, a picture or, or a video like on YouTube or Netflix, they'll know what I'm talking about. It's amazing. It's such an incredible thing to watch. Because of the digital nomad life, we got to do these things. So things I, I would never want to take back. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. But if that's the uh, if that's the end of the positives, uh, we can we can share <laughs> we can just share a couple of things like about the lifestyle that we didn't like. But we would never know this if we hadn't tried it. Absolutely. So just as a general overview, we'll just list a few things of why it didn't work for us. So this one seems really obvious now. I'm saying it out loud, but. We constantly had to move around, guys. Travel. <laughs> like, Travelling. <laughs> it was just so much constant moving from place to place. I mean, we didn't try it for very long um, due to mental health reasons on my behalf, which I'm going to go into in a bit. But like, that's why it got cut short. Because we were kind of thinking we'd be living this lifestyle at least for two years, but we only did it for six months in the end. But yeah, I think we started doing about a month in each place or six weeks And that was too fast for us anyway. That was definitely too fast. So constant moving. When you move to a new place, you have to find a new gym, new supermarket and all those kind of like get to know the area, which can be exciting. But when you're only there for a month, it's just it got very old very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. But if we were arranging to stay somewhere for too long, that would make us nervous. What if we hate it? What if we've just paid 
three months rent up front through Airbnb or whatever. And then we get there and we hate it. So we could never find the right balance of, oh, we're moving too quick or we were too worried about staying for too long. Yeah. It can also be like a really lonely life. I mean, when you're traveling, I think you constantly make friends because you're either staying at a hostel or a hotel. Depends what kind of traveler you are. But yeah, you can go out to bars and meet people. And I'm sure you can do that as a digital nomad and there'll be kind of specific groups or expat groups that you can go to. But it did feel very lonely because it's kind of like, well, I'm only here for a month. So what's the point in making friends because I'm just going to leave or the other digital nomad that I've just met is going to leave tomorrow or whatever. So yeah, that's that's another downside. We just didn't have that social life. And yeah, it was. Uh, I was surprised, but it was a very lonely lifestyle, which which uh, yeah which made us sad. But also something that made us sad is we're, you're always like on your laptops. You're always using technology because if you're not working, you're then researching the next place you're going to. And as I was saying, like the pressure to book somewhere nice is, is really big. So you want to get it right. You do so much researching and then you're researching like the next place and then the next place after that. And you just, you don't really get time to just stay and, and enjoy where you are uh, at the moment. For me, just I, I didn't realize how much I love just having a home, which is my home, it's my space, and then using that as a base to travel a bit, come back home, travel a bit, come back home. I really, really didn't like moving from one crappy Airbnb apartment to the next. So they were kind of like the the negatives really as an overview. But yeah, like I said, it actually ended quite abruptly uh, due to my mental health. And so a little bit of a backstory to that is um, before we started the digital nomad lifestyle, I was having therapy um, because I started to have panic attacks kind of during COVID, I think it was. And I wanted to sort that out. So I did in total 18 months I think with my therapist and towards the start she did some tests on me and it turns out I was very surprised to hear this but uh, I have PTSD um, which if you're not sure what that is that's post-traumatic stress disorder so that can be caused by any type of trauma Uh, for me it was in my childhood but I mean when I first got told it I thought what? I'm not a soldier or like I haven't been to war or anything. It's you just assume you just kind of associate it with, yeah, soldiers really. Um, so yeah, I was very, very surprised I had PTSD, but thankfully now I can say I've worked really hard with my therapist and I'm, I'm okay now, but it did get really dark in the middle there, kind of in the middle of our digital nomad lifestyle. So I think like Nick said, Lisbon was great for us. We had friends there and we, we'd already been to the city. We knew it pretty well. And then when we got to Barcelona, it kind of all fell apart for me. I was having several panic attacks every single day, if not like for the whole day. But it got really bad where it was like I couldn't sleep so sleep deprivation I then couldn't eat anymore I had no appetite whatsoever and I really just spiraled down and down um, to a point where I couldn't leave the apartment it was it was really scary at one point and I I, on top of all of that had this guilt that I was putting all this mess on Nick I just felt really bad Um, so yeah it was a pretty rough time wasn't it it was an awful time and yeah the digital nomad life, like the uncertainty, nowhere is home, I think really contributed. Yeah, you, know, you, you had these you had these issues anyway with anxiety, but the digital nomad life made it all so much worse. And I didn't know what to do for you or, or or with you. I didn't know how to help you. It was a really scary time, and I could see it was debilitating for you. Like you either couldn't get out of bed or you're sat on the sofa and you're worrying about when you have to next get up off the sofa and you were in a real bad way. And I was thinking, I was thinking to myself, wow, like I've been fortunate not to go through any serious mental health struggles, um, but it looked so terrifying and scary for you. I thought, you know, give me a broken arm any day, 
I'd rather have a physical uh, injury than than a mental one. So yeah, the, the whole time in Barcelona, it was it was really scary. For I didn't know. I've I've learned, and I, what we'll, we'll share on the podcast. I've learned how to to help someone with anxiety now. It's, it's it's great that I've learned that. But I just felt so helpless, and you were in such a bad place, and we were just thinking, what do we do? Once our agreement runs out on our apartment in Barcelona, we thought let's just get you home to the UK for a little bit and then see where we go from there. Do we carry on with this life? Yeah. Um, but because some serious things were happening, like I couldn't sleep or eat, we knew I needed kind of some immediate help. Um, so actually, it's, I mean, it sounds really dodgy, but it was definitely legal because it was through like the national Proper website. Yeah. Um, so we contacted a doctor and it said that you could have this consultation and we assumed that would be in person or at least over the phone or Zoom or something. Uh, but he just texted us, just dropped me a text, <laughs> slid into the DMs. <laughs> yeah, it was so weird. It was very strange and uh, just asked how I was feeling. I told him and he sent through a prescription and Nick went to the pharmacy and picked up. And I mean, it wasn't like he was giving me some like low level drugs. It was the equivalent of Xanax, which I mean, everybody has different opinions. But to me, like for someone who I really would love to get through this myself. I'm not saying that in a kind of like warrior way, like, oh no, I'm bigger than that. It was more of like, I don't, I didn't want to become reliant on them. And I knew they were just like a band aid or a plaster to, to kind of get me to get a bit stronger. So then I could do it myself. It's not a long-term plan. Right. But yeah, I found them incredibly strong and yeah, I want to make it very clear that I'm not giving any advice, um, about medicine you do what you do in your position and take advice from an actual medical professional, not from me, but this was just my story. But uh, yeah, so I I took some tablets, way less than what he prescribed, and they just knocked me out, guys. Like I would wake up as an absolute zombie and they just took all my emotions out. Like there was one point where we we had actually left the house. We went out so that we could go into nature I just needed to go like walking near trees and stuff just be somewhere green rather than in a city and I remember we were like on the train and I just I was just like I just feel nothing like I was crying on the train and I was trying to make sure people couldn't see but I just had tears running out my eyes but I was like I don't even know why I'm crying because I just feel emotionless I just it felt worse than the anxiety I didn't like it. it was just like nothing and I just I was like hitting my chest just kind of like I can't feel anything it was really horrible after Barcelona we traveled home and that was actually because we had some kind of personal commitments with like Hindus and weddings that we were attending and while we came home I just felt so much better I don't know whether it was like being around friends and family feeling safe because we were staying at Nick's mum's house like somewhere very somewhere very familiar and comforting and I felt so much better and we were really because we knew that our next step was Brazil and we kept thinking like is this the right decision is this what we should be doing and we were like no we love Brazil it's our favorite country in the world I mean if Brazil can't make me feel good where can kind of scenario and like yeah I really was feeling a lot better I wasn't taking the tablets I think I only took nine in total over the month we were in Barcelona and that was enough I didn't want to take them anymore and yeah, I was still working with my therapist, but yeah. So we left the UK for Brazil. We were going to be staying in Sao Paulo for three months. And within those three months, kind of jet setting around Brazil, finding uh, or meeting friends that we'd met in Brazil before, checking out the beaches and just having a great time. But after 11 days, we flew back home, didn't we? Yeah, you got worse. It was almost... As soon as we arrived in Brazil, like as soon as we arrived in a foreign country, all your feelings came back. I was saying to you to help you calm down. I was saying, look, it's OK. Look, if if you keep feeling like this, and you're not getting better. We'll just go home. But I was secretly thinking that we're not really going to go home, are we? Because you'll be fine. Like Eventually, you'll, you'll calm down and you'll feel comfortable and happy here. But every day I could see you got worse and worse and worse. And then yeah, after, like you said, uh, less than two weeks, it was clear that the right thing to do was to come home. And that that, that was the end of our, our digital nomad adventure, but it, it had to end. Uh, maybe 
Maybe we genuinely didn't like it. It wasn't for us. Maybe it was just the wrong time in our lives to do it. But I could see you needed to get back home to the UK. And it worked, didn't it? As soon as we got back, you still had some work to do with your therapist. But as soon as we got back home, you felt a lot better very quickly. Yeah, I just I just wanted to be here and that's what makes me feel comfortable. But the decision to come home was a real big one for me. I felt really awful for Nick. I had all this guilt that I'd kind of robbed him of this three-month Brazil adventure. And I knew when he was telling me, oh, you know, we can just go home. I knew he was saying that to make me feel better because if you take the pressure off, nor- with me anyway, if you take the pressure off, I calm down and then I don't need to do what I was saying I needed. But yeah, it was really, really difficult. And it took days for us to really come to a decision. I mean, we just paid for the flights to get out there. We paid for our Airbnb for three months. Luckily, we didn't spend that in the end. I mean, we came to a deal with the host. So yeah, it was a really difficult decision for us to make. But as soon as I got on that flight, I knew 100% this is the right decision. I instantly calmed down. My panic attacks, I mean, when I came home, I still was having panic attacks, but it was just on a completely different level. Um, So if anybody out there has experienced a a panic attack before, like I feel for you, it is one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through. It really was. And yeah, as I said before, fortunately, um, I haven't experienced a panic attack before, so uh, I don't know what it feels like. And because of that, that's been a really big part of my life, trying to explain to Nick kind of how I'm feeling. So an idea came to me when we were planning this episode and I thought not only has Nick not felt it, I think there's a lot of people listening, thankfully, who have not felt it. So I was trying to piece together in my mind what it feels like so that you can kind of, I mean, I don't want you to experience it, but I want you to experience it in a sense, kind of in an auditory way so you can really understand what someone's going through when they're completely just stunned and they they can't move their body and, and they literally feel like they're going to die. It's a really horrible experience. So if you are somebody that suffers with anxiety or panic issues, I would suggest that you skip the podcast ahead by about three to four minutes because the next piece might be quite triggering for you. Um, but for the rest of you, this is what a panic attack felt like for me. The first thing you'll notice is a funny offbeat feeling. The rhythm of your body is no longer in sync. Everything now has its own time zone and works independently from the rest of the systems in your body. You become acutely aware of everything, how your skin feels against your clothes, your dry tongue against the roof of your mouth, and how deafening the silence is. You instantly have an impending sense of fear in the pit of your stomach. It's a mix of that procrastination feeling, but also like watching a scary movie, knowing something is just about to jump out at you. You put it off, ignore, 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 until your mind is surrounded by a toxic amount of suffering. You're dizzy and disorientated. You can feel every sensation around you. Your body is picking up on anything that moves, breathes, or makes a sound as your fight or flight response peaks. Your heart is racing, but still off beat and louder than ever. The tiny hairs all over your body stand up to attention, like a mini army trying to protect you. Your hands are clammy and your brain can't take in any more auditory input, which you would think sounds momentarily peaceful, but it's the opposite. It's like being trapped in a nightmare where everyone is slowly slipping away from you into darkness. With every breath, you're becoming more and more isolated. You can feel something behind you and your body is screaming at you to run. Do what you can to get away at all costs. Panic sets in. How long is this going to last? Is this me for the rest of my life? Why can't this just stop and go away? Resist, resist, resist. On the outside, you can see you're in a hotel room with a bed, soft furnishings, lights and patterned cushions purposefully designed to make you feel happy, warm and fuzzy inside. But why doesn't it work on you? Why are you so different from everyone else? Why can you feel so much discomfort? Your natural reactions to keep you safe are ironically the exact opposite of what you need right now. You want to run and scream, but you need to stop. 
take a breath and listen to what your body is shouting out loud. Anxiety is the voice of concern that refuses to be ignored. It's the crew saying to the captain of a ship, you need to pay attention to this. You need to treat yourself like the parent of a screaming toddler who is constantly grabbing at your leg, demanding to be listened to. What happens when you stop what you're doing? Get down on the child's level, listen to their wants, needs and fears. The child stops screaming. They slowly start to calm down until there's no problem anymore. There's no more danger. All this time you thought anxiety was the enemy but it was that uncomfortable feeling in between you and the anxiety itself, standing as a wall, pretending to protect you, when in fact it was the wall separating you from the recovery. The next time you feel anxiety or panic, at the first moment you detect it, stop, recognize it, listen to it, and accept the way you feel. That was really well put together, Amy. I was, I'm impressed with that. And by the end of, of listening to that, I feel really happy and calm. And I wasn't expecting to, but you made some really good points in there. And I would like to share with people, as, as the person who's supporting someone going through anxiety, as long as you remind them to, like, as you said, to accept how, you were, how you're feeling, welcome in the anxiety like it's a friend trying to protect you don't fight against it we all have certain levels of anxiety if we didn't have any anxiety then we wouldn't bother because it's that little bit of worry isn't it we wouldn't bother doing anything we wouldn't bother getting good jobs or going to a supermarket to buy food we'd just be like oh everything will be okay and we'd all we'd all end up dying so like anxiety is there to help us to protect us it's kept us alive and as soon as you see it that way then it's not scary. And the the worry like oh and the dread, the fear, the panic, all just disappears. You accept it, you ride the wave, is what I like to say. You imagine you're floating in the sea. If you're fighting against the waves, it's impossible. Mother nature's too strong. But when you lie there, and even if they're quite big waves, you just lie there and just accept it. It's really calm and it's a really nice experience. Yeah, I think of it as that way. And uh, you tell me, but I think me talking to you in that way uh, really helps you. Yeah, no, it's really helpful when um, when you like remind me of all this different advice that uh, my therapist gave me. And yeah, whenever you say ride the wave, it always like transports me back to Brazil because there was a time where I was feeling really, really anxious. And um, yeah. We we went down to the beach and it was raining actually and we still went into the sea and um, I was fighting against the waves. I was, this is choking me up actually, but yeah, I was like getting really annoyed and kept getting taken out to the side and you just said like, just let it be, just let it like, just float with it and just ride the wave. And um, I do, I think about that every time. So yeah, but no, just to finish off this whole mental health section, like yeah, I'm really happy to say that I put in the work with my therapist. I meditate every single day. I'm really happy to say that I haven't had a panic attack for 10 whole months. Yes, amazing. So yeah, I feel stronger than ever and I've worked through all my trauma and stuff. So I honestly, I feel great. I feel amazing. I feel really, really strong. So yeah, and just thank you for your help, Nick. I, I know I've said that before, but yeah. Like you literally wear a rock and you'd think that you wouldn't be because you didn't have a clue of what was going on. <laughs> but no, you you were amazing. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, I had to learn how, how to help. At first I was uh, maybe a bit useless or yeah, I just think, oh, I'll just do everything for you. But that's not really getting to the root of, of the problem. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm very, yeah, it looked like a horrendous journey you went through. I'm very proud of you. That's way tougher than anything I've ever had to do. So you are much stronger than I am. Obrigada. <laughs> I just feel like I had to say it in another language. <laughs> uh, okay, right. Let's crack on. Let's go into some more digital nomad stuff. So 
So a few weeks ago, we sat down virtually online uh, to chat to Stephanie about her digital nomad lifestyle. She spent many years as an expat, but has changed lifestyles during the pandemic. I'm Stephanie Fuccio. I am a podcast editor. Uh, I write about podcasting and and I run the global podcast editors community. And I'm pretty much just as obsessed with the medium as humanly possible. <laughs> a fellow podcast geek. Fantastic. Yay, yes. <laughs> we always love that. So where are you right now? Ah, good question. I am in Bucharest, Romania. Ah, oh, interesting destination. How long have you been there for? About two months. And we're here a total of three months. So we've got a little under a month to go. Do you normally stay in places for that duration of time? Normally. There hasn't really been a normally t- since 2020 for us. <laughs> um, <laughs> right now we are switching places every three months according to visas, but that is not the goal nor hopefully the future. In t- 2023, we're hoping we can slow down a little bit. A lot, actually. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, let's we'll start talking about the dream digital nomad life, the dream lifestyle. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I think uh, you might have similar uh, opinions to us, but mm-hmm. let's see. Yeah. So I know you've said you're a, a, a podcast editor, but can you talk about you know, like the, the work you do, but how that fits in to being a digital nomad uh, working anywhere in the world, please? Oh, sure. Well, most of the th- Actually, all of the stuff I do in podcasting is online. It's either editing and then like transferring files back and forth to clients or I write in the cloud and do stuff like that. So everything I do is is very, very mobile as long as I have good Internet <laughs> and not just in the country because I've, I've lived in some countries where like the businesses have good Internet, but like at home, it isn't necessarily true. I'm looking at you, Germany, mm-hmm. but but actually good Internet at home or on my mobile phone when I'm about like just regular great Internet service is absolutely at the top of our list everywhere we go. In your opinion, what are the pros and the cons? The ability to literally go anywhere is rather nice, but you are subject to either the visa requirements, like you've got like 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, that kind of thing, or six months, or you have to like put a lot of paperwork time in to do like one year digital nomad visas, which doesn't really sound reasonable for me to put a a lot of work in for a one year visa, but there's that. Yeah. So you can be anywhere, but for how long? So it's like kind of like a, the biggest pro and con that I can think of off the bat. Do you feel like in your lifestyle, do you feel free, free as a bird or, or the opposite? <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't become a digital nomad to like travel a lot. We did this because of economic circumstances because of the pandemic. So I think, I mean, it's nice to, to be able to say that I'm in X, Y, and Z place and to be able to go to like cafes and work and that kind of thing. But free as a bird. I actually probably felt freer for me, for my personality type. I like to be like one year stable or like two year stables. Like I'm cool with sort of longer term contracts in one place. And then I explore that place and the surrounding area. So for me, being an expat with a local contract was more comfortable than being a digital nomad because everywhere we go, we're constantly researching the next place. So like a lot of our time is figuring out all of the details for the next and the next next place. So it doesn't feel as freeing as those stinking videos with somebody with their laptop on a beach. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, screw those guys. (laughs) Why do they do that? There's so much on social media. Yeah. Why would you ruin your laptop like that? I don't I don't Uh, quite understand. (laughs) Yeah, and you can never work on your laptop in the sunshine because you can't see your screen. Exactly. I don't know what kind of work these people are doing, but it just doesn't seem feasible to me. (laughs) Maybe they're just models, you know, maybe they're just taking these photos looking like they're working (laughs) on their laptop. If somebody hasn't done this life and they're listening to this, like, I mean, we could sound uh, a little privileged with these cons, right? Even what I've just thought of another one that if you're booking particularly through Airbnb, uh, they say, oh, we have a full kitchen. (laughs) Yeah, you can cook. And then you have to, you get there and you have to buy it. A ton of plates, oh knives and forks, boards, things to cook knives, with. And it's just so spatulas. frustrating. And the couches. 
I think it's very generous oh, to call God. them couches. <laughs> it's barely more than a desk with like the tiniest of cushion on it. I mean, just the furniture is like I had no problem with Ikea before I started living in Airbnb places. And now I'm like, I think you need to shut down. This is just mean. <laughs> it's cruel to have people live in on this furniture. <laughs> yeah, exactly. These, these Airbnbs aren't designed for long term uh, no. living uh, no. for comfort. While we're on the topic of accommodation, we also spoke to Kolya. My name is Kolya. I used to be a digital nomad, but yeah, I've been settled down for about uh, four months now and I love the life of a normal human. We'll go into his story in part two, but this guy knows all about mixing work and travel. The places where you've stayed for quite a long time, yeah, like sometimes six months, How did you negotiate or how did you work your way around accommodation? Like, are we talking booking.com, Airbnb? What did you do? Yeah, I used to really hate booking.com and I really looked down on on people going to hotels. But uh, in the last couple of months, actually, I came to learn to enjoy hotels again. How nice it is to have everything presented to you, breakfast included, nice pool. Everybody cleans up behind you. It's amazing. But yeah, no, we are uh, and we were like big Airbnb users. Having said that, we never really just went and booked a place. We always went into communication with the uh, house owner or the apartment owner and uh, told them, hey, we would like to come. We would love to stay for four, five, six weeks. Maybe there's something you can do with the price. You have the security of Airbnb, but you get a nice price. That's it for part one of our Digital Nomad episode. Here's what's coming up in part two. My therapist would say the fact I've mentioned it twice probably means I need one. You're using humor uh, as a defense mechanism. I'm using I, humor I, as a defense mechanism. <laughs> For a bonus point, can you tell me what language I said that in? Tin Sing Zhu. So Estonian companies have heaps of upsides. Estonia has something called an e-residency. See you then. Before we wrap this up, we've got a question for you. Is your boy Tarquin going on a gap year? Is your gal pal Rachel off to eat, pray, love herself silly? then the best way to support this show is to share it with all your travel buddies. Thanks, Thanks, bye! bye.